when I ostensibly shot Susan Berman and I'm at her house, leaning down, talking to her or listening to her cold breath, I didn't have the gun in my hand. I didn't have any blood on me. There was plenty of blood in the scene. This is Paul Blumenthal. He played Bob Durst in the recreations of The Jinx Part Two. And talking to him, you get the idea that he really got into it. I was leaning on the floor against her and at one point holding her up. I thought I did it. You know, I, I'm not quite sure if that was fantasy or reality at that point. Hi, I'm Zach Stewart Pontier, one of the filmmakers behind HBO's The Jinx. Welcome to the final episode of the official Jinx podcast, a show where we took you behind the scenes of Andrew Jarecki's documentary series that became a real life murder investigation. Today, Andrew and I are pulling back the curtain on our filmmaking process. We're gonna talk with some of the behind the scenes magicians who worked with us to make The Jinx part two into the Emmy nominated series that it is. We're gonna dive into the sets, the wardrobe, the sound, and how we blended it all together to create what showed up on screen. Andrew, it's our last time in the studio. I think that's right. We've talked a ton about the story of Robert Durst. We've talked about things that didn't make it into the show. We haven't talked a lot about the craft, right, of actually making the show. I mean, I think a, a show of, with this scope that takes years to make, obviously, is the product of not just a lot of individual great artists and craftspeople, but is also the product of the kind of esprit de corps between all the department heads. We did a lot of Zooms to sit with them and say, this is what these recreations are for. This is what they're about. By the way, here's the big picture stuff on the whole show, right? Yeah. Talking to them about what the, about what this part two of the Jinx was all about. Right. But by department heads, you mean people like our production designer, Jenny Burton, DP, director of photography, Davy Jakes, David Jacobson, and costume designer, Cassandra Shu. I mean, there's so many talented people worked on this show. Yeah. We're going to hear from some of them today and also Paul Blumenthal the actor who played Bob, who's always fun to talk to. That's, Almost like that's a, exciting. I like a reunion, a reunion show. So who are we going to talk to? We're going to talk to Jenny, who's the production designer. Yes. Jenny was incredible. I mean, she and her team, they're, they do great work. She's able to like look at these photos of stuff that we're trying to recreate, figure out what the room should look like, build the room, and then find all the stuff that should go into the room. Everything like from a desk lamp that's period 1980 to a notebook that she had to redesign with the right stationery to match like another old grainy picture. It's the attention to detail was out of this world. You know, Jenny is, is the most positive person ever on a set. You can say to Jenny, like, hey, I know we said that we needed, you know, three people to walk up a hill, but really what we need is 27 people to cut a diamond in the back of a Rolls Royce. And she'll say, I got it. And and you realize, like, you're giving her completely conflicting instructions. We're changing things because we're editing the film while we're... And, and Jenny is just always, yes. She's like, yes, we can do that. She's never like, you people are crazy, which is, you know, something we've heard occasionally. I am Jenny Burton, and I was the production designer on part two of The Jinx. My role would be to work with the director and the DP to talk about the look of the film, how to develop it together on how we perceive the look of the film. And I would do drawings of sets, including the dimensions, and then have the sets actually built and created and decorated, and I oversee every bit of it. One of the more interesting sets I think we created was Bob's hotel room, right? That's the one... When he's hiding out in New Orleans, you see it in episode one. But we knew that we'd be cutting from these, like, kind of search fo photos to the recreation. Um, so it was really important that, like, every detail is right. Yeah, that, that one I particularly loved because there were some photographs. But, of course, it was, again, so far ago that the hotel had been renovated 
two times over since then. For instance, it had a very particular carpet with a pattern in it and a particular green, and it was impossible to recreate. So I made a stencil and had the carpet painted with a, a stencil that I drew to match what I could determine was the correct size of the of the pattern from the photographs. So we went we went pretty deep. We talked about the hotel room, which we did build, but the lobby, tell us about the lobby, right? We were able to take a hotel in New Jersey, I believe, and turn it into a hotel in New Orleans. I had like, a, you know, how sometimes hotels have like artwork that conveys the city. So I had artwork with pictures of Bourbon Street made and obviously the signs that say, you know, New Orleans Marriott. The flyers. That was a, a, yeah, a genius. A you know, a rack with flyers for all the things you can do in New Orleans, tourist things. And we made our own original flyers for that. Right. And but Jenny, do you think that if if that little, you know, when you go in a hotel and it's got that little thing with 57 pockets and one of this like, go, go to visit Howe Caverns or go to visit the <laughs> world's largest ball of string. Do you think if we had just had ones from New Jersey, do you think the audience would have noticed it? One person would have, and that's enough for me. <laughs> this is how you know I love our job, right? Wait, to pull off this one sequence of Bob's arrest, we had three different locations. Right. The exterior is the New Orleans Hotel. The interior yep. of the lobby is a hotel in New Jersey that looked like a weird medieval castle on the outside, but in the inside looked like the <laughs> New Orleans Marriott. And then we're going up to Bob's bedroom, which is ostensibly in that hotel, but that's in Brooklyn. Right. It's kind of, it is yep. kind of amazing. Another pivotal, I would say, set in episode one is the interrogation room, right? And that, and that, the sound is like kind of well recorded, but visually all there is is this grainy footage from like the top corner of the room. Just to just to clarify, the when we say interrogation room, this is after Bob is arrested in New Orleans, John Lewin flies out so that he can sit with him and try to sort of pick his brain and get him to incriminate himself. I love it. I love it so much. Let's play a little bit of it. I'm, a, I'm, I'm John Lewis. I am a, uh, I'm a deputy DA. Um, mind if Mr. Durst or Bob, you, you tell me. Um, Bob is fine. Okay. Um, so, Bob, so they kind of have to figure out a makeshift setting, and there is an interrogation room or a conference room. Yeah, absolutely. It was such a strange and grainy photograph, and again, you can kind of like grab some things that you know about materials, like how big a rubber tile on the floor is, about a foot square. So you can kind of start to use those measurements to create a, a pattern for the set that is somewhat realistic. Something interesting about the chairs is that they're they're actually prison chairs, like the kind of things that prisoners sit on, and they can attach their manacles to the, you know, to the bases of them. So that they were very particular kind of made for prison. So we ended up thinking the best solution was to just build them from scratch. And I remember, like, I think only four of them were strong enough to sit on, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all this room full of chairs and no place to sit. Don't sit on those. Another thing I remember about that set is that we weren't building a ceiling, right? And it was all about how tall the walls had to be. Right. We know like in filmmaking, one of the things that, that we talk about at the beginning is camera angles, right? And one of the things that we're, we thought was the most important for this uh, set was overhead shots. So ordinarily, you might make a set wall a foot or two taller than a wall is in real life. And then you don't really need a ceiling. You know, the, the walls kind of just drift off and you don't, your eye doesn't perceive them as being any taller than a regular room. But then if you went overhead, right over the tops of the walls and you were that far away from a tabletop, you would be able to tell how many feet above you were. So we had to pick a nice sweet spot where we could seem intimately involved in like some of these beautiful shots, like the Bob's getting a cup of coffee and the coffee is swirling in the cup. And there are some really great moments that heighten the drama of this moment that are really beautiful. So we've talked a little bit about how we build the sets and obviously in the show, the show moves seamlessly back and forth between the recreation, 
and the archival. And a big way that that works is the sound. And so we thought we would talk to our supervising sound editor extraordinaire, Carl Anderson. Who's Carl? Well, Carl, he is in charge of making sure that we can extract clear dialogue from these recorded phone calls that have all kinds of interference and grinding sounds and people calling each other from noisy prisons and things like that. So he's in charge, I think, of, of making sure that, that we get a, a clear line to the audience of what's happening. We caught Kyle on the road. Thank you so much, buddy, for making the time to chat. But the sound is just a bit different. When looking at season two of The Jinx and you sort of get dropped into the story, you start to frame the entire story by his first meeting with John Lewin and interrogation scene. What kind of stuff are we hearing in that room? John Lewin has a pocket recorder that he uses. And for us, first and foremost, it's like, well, let's take the audio and clean it up a little bit. So we sort of started cleaning it up and it it got to this point where it was like, like, oh my Oh, my God, you can hear everything that's happening. Like, you can hear all the details. John Lewin opening his notebook, putting his pen down, uh, touching the table. Like, all of these things were becoming audible. And so we sort of started wanting to, you know, implement that kind of detail in the recreation footage. We get to sort of discover and create a language for how those are going to interact. Right, right. And and through the original interrogation room, like we know we're looking at footage from a ceiling and those cameras don't make noise, they're silent. But to help you understand that you're looking at the footage from a ceiling camera, we put a little sound on the camera, just a little hum, buzz, like just a little sort of thing that makes the cut to it stick out. So that now you understand fundamentally, like, oh, this is recreation, and this is actual footage, and this is an actual recording. And it sort of it makes that all make sense. It really does, because when you're in recreation land, like that room has a real sound oh, yeah. to it, right? We want that room to sound like what it is, a fairly intimidating, cold environment. So what's a, an uncomfortable tone or a sort of sense of place? A simple minor chord that sort of works to create a sort of sense of unease. That you can't really lock into, but you sort of get a feel for. It has an almost tunneling effect that sort of makes that space a little foreboding through these sort of subconscious sounds. It's so interesting how how necessary sound is for that like kind of trifecta of understanding. I think people like forget all the time that sound has this subconscious power that image doesn't have. Like image is very the, the literal self. Mm. And sound is the, is the sublime self. We've talked about now the sets and the sound, but there's also the people and the costumes. You know, we don't see faces in these recreations normally, so we see everything else, right? We're on the back of somebody's head, but you're also seeing, like, the collar of their shirt. And there's the detail, like, of matching a photograph, right? Bob's got a specific shirt on or jumpsuit on that we're trying to match exactly. Or, you know, a time period. We have, like, an 80s scene that takes place in an office building with 20 people people in it. And all the costumes have to be kind of perfect because we're going to be featuring little tiny details of all the various clothing. And the costume designer, Cassandra Shu, did like an incredible job. For sure. Hi, I'm Cassandra and I am a costume designer and I am there to dress everyone that you see on camera. <laughs> 
But what kind of challenges go into doing something l- like this? The Bob and Debbie wedding photo yes. was like one of the first big challenges. And that was particularly difficult because it was in the late 90s. It's actually, it's like the early 2000s, but yeah, pretty much. But she was wearing a suit that was like more 80s. And then it's like the suit shape. That's what we're gravitating towards, like in order to recreate it. But, you know, Andrew from like a director's perspective was focused on other things and he was obsessed with the buttons. Yeah, I think we're lucky enough to have an actual photograph that was taken moments after Bob and Debbie are married. This is like the least romantic wedding of all time. And if you get that right, then you really feel like you're you're in the moment with them. Yeah, absolutely. And we scoured the internet. We scoured every thrift shop, my assistant and I, in Brooklyn and in Manhattan. So we found the best base possible and we found these giant buttons in the bottom of a barrel at this shop. And like, they were the last (laughs) eight buttons. And I'm not joking. It was like crazy how this all came together and nobody knew, but we actually dropped one of the buttons and these buttons were made out of like, I don't even know what, and it shattered. (laughs) And we had to like super glue it back together, but it, it ended up looking perfect. That dress. I mean, it really did sell it. I saw the final shot and like going from the footage to the photo, it was like seamless and it was amazing and beautiful. Let's talk about Bob a little more. What was it like to match his costumes? I think Bob in his prison uniform was really interesting. And I think real life Bob wanted to present himself in this very specific way to the courtroom. And to to maintain that sort of same feel for Paul, our actor, I think we had to size up everything. I think everything he wore was two or three times larger than his person. And we did that purposefully. So what you're alluding to, just for the audience, is that Bob would wear oversized clothing to sort of make himself look smaller. And Paul was a little bigger than Bob was. So you had to even, you had to like to achieve that effect, you had to even go bigger. Yeah, we definitely scaled up a lot. And I remember like the prison jumpsuit, where I think we had to like, we had a bit of a tough time finding like the triple X in order to make him look super small and emaciated. Was it? sort of interesting to see it all come together was it yeah what was it like to watch you know i grew up watching like forensic files which i loved but those recreations are definitely not on the same (sighs) level as the jinx and it, it adds to this reality and it adds to the story in a way that i think is really impactful Last but not least is Robert Durst himself. No, the guy who played Robert Durst in all the recreations for part two was Paul Blumenthal. Who's Paul? He is the unsung hero of the Bob Durst saga. He's an interesting guy because for 40 years he was a trial lawyer. He was, a you know, he came from a completely different walk of life. Um, but he really has the soul of an actor and he really was able to embody Bob Durst and in all of his movement and oddity and and quirkiness. Hi, gentlemen. My name is Paul Blumenthal. I played Robert Durst in the recreations. Were you familiar with Robert Durst? Because what I remember about your audition was that it started with an empty frame and you came up like this, blinking and looking, and we were like, oh my gosh, that's Robert Durst. Like, and everybody else was kind of like doing like a normal audition. How did you know to do that? I never heard of Robert Durst before. I I was not aware of the jinx. I think that the requirements for the casting listing was to play somebody who is stalking somebody in the woods. 
And that's all I remember. So I popped up out of the woods, as you had told me, from the bottom, and I shone my you know, big, brilliant eyes like this, and I guess that caught your attention. So then you, f- you get cast, and what happens next? Well, I went from Philadelphia t- to New York, and I met your, your wonderful wardrobe person. She's, she's absolutely am- amazing. But there was this huge guy who actually was fitting me into a large prison jumpsuit, and I'm not being facetious, but the legs were about two feet longer than my body. So they kept trying to resize. I think they had three different orange prison jumpsuits, and they were all too big for me. Anyway, ultimately, they got it. I mean, it was an interesting challenge that you had playing Bob in the recreations because you were being shown real footage of his interactions that we were trying to get you to recreate. You were really good at watching the material and then trying it in the scene and Andrew would direct you and here and there and then we would do it again. But what was that like from your perspective? I've always prided myself in watching people and watching people's bodies. One of the uh, PAs had sent me something, uh, watch Bob Durst's mannerisms. And I tried to adapt his burping, his gestures, and how he moved his hands all the time, his not obvious nervousness, but his subtle nervousness. So I tried to adapt all of that in the first scene when I sat down in the Faw interrogation room. Well, you did it very well. You were really good at, because with these recreations, we were never focused on, you know, hardly ever focused even on your whole body. It was like, as you say, these really on your hands or on the feet. And like, so we're really seeing just a small piece of, of the, of the puzzle of, and you really were able to like in, in imbue that with a lot of emotion. And it's, it's hard because you want to be able to work with an actor who actually embodies the character, it's a great pleasure to be able to work with the same person consistently. And you were always really, you know, did it brilliantly, but also we're always kind of down for the challenge. Well, for the listening public, Bob had something called hydrocephalus, which means water on the brain. Now, what do you do when you have fluid that has to be drained off from your head? You create a little valve, you create a little piece of tubing. So it comes from the back of the head into the spinal column. So your hair and makeup people were fabulous to work with. And they created something, a false shunt that got better and better. And it's kind of funny. When they first started, it looked like she had hands sewn the equivalent of a very, very large spider and shaved my head stuck this in the top of my head and then used the equivalent of like a, a hair implant machine to shoot little plastic pellets into my scalp to hold it in place. It didn't hurt going in, but it stays, they stayed in my scalp for at least a week, each application. And at the end of all that, I'm going, I miss it. (laughs) (laughs) At the top of my head. The shunt. We miss the shunt. The shunt. It does sound, Zach, I'm concerned that, you know, Paul is a personal injury lawyer, and it sounds like he's kind of creating a foundation for an insurance claim right now. Oh. Oh, yeah, well, the good thing, the statute of limitations is wrong. That's all right. So... (laughs) There was one recreation, right, Andrew, that was probably the toughest to pull off, recreating the L.A. courtroom. We had a ton uh, to shoot and cover, and we were trying a bunch of stuff. We were experimenting with being in Bob's perspective and looking out at the courtroom. Well, let's let's keep trying to push the boundary. Totally. And, you know, so much of part two takes place there. It's something that everyone we talked to mentioned. Well, the courtroom obviously was, you know... The courtroom is like its own monster. It's like the courtroom was a really tough one for costumes. So the courtroom, we knew we were always going to have to build it, and matching it was complicated. So we huddled with the production designer, Jenny, and the first question was, which courtroom was it going to be? Because the trial takes place in two. 
we always knew we wanted to, from the very beginning, that we would get to build this courtroom. But which courtroom was it going to be? Because the trial started and then COVID hit and they changed the venue. So there were two different, completely different courtrooms in all of the court TV footage. And I think that after a lot of discussion, like cl clearly one was more cinematic and more interesting as a room. It was more of like a classic wood panel courtroom. And that was more interesting to us visually. And so COVID is happening in the course of the trial. And sometimes people are wearing masks, sometimes they're not. And that all had to be matched. So that was one of the challenges that Cassandra faced, the costume designer. The court was hard because we were trying to match like archival footage. There was pre-COVID and post-COVID yes. courtroom footage. And so we had to make sure we had the correct masks for everyone. And there were lots of different types of PPE at the time. They ran the gamut from fabric to KN95 and also a lot of glasses. We were like looking at the courtroom and everyone, like I think Jenny and I had borrowed like 15 pairs of glasses that we had to make sure matched exactly to the archival footage to what these people were wearing. And I've never done anything like that before. And then Carl had to deal with and untangle, how is it going to sound? Yeah, you know, everybody's got a microphone in front of them in the courtroom, and they're all recorded horribly. I don't know why, how they managed to do that, but they seem to. And because the personalities in the courtroom are also, you know, have a, a dramatic effect on the rhythm, I, I mean, by looking at the two legal representation teams and, and their sort of the way they talk and their pacing and how they work. And so there's this sort of realm of how we clean it up, too much, not enough. And then what we add to the courtroom, it really becomes a, a sort of an, an orchestration. Like it's more of an orchestra musical thing than maybe a sound thing. Yeah, yeah. The memory of, of this already, and it hasn't been that long, is so warm and fun. And I did a good job this time taking pictures, and I was looking through last night, and I just had the biggest grin. Just even even the stuff that, like, went wrong at the time, I was smiling about. So, I mean, I, I do feel, like, incredibly fortunate that we were able to work with this whole cast of interesting and talented people. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is such a unique experience. The subject was was so unusual, and, and the fact that we sort of found ourselves in it and ended up lucking into a lot of aspects of the story that were, you know, unimaginable, the, the, the most obvious being the, the bathroom confession. But having the, like, the catcher's mitt of being able to gather all that story and then being able to, you know, then being able to express it through the vision of all these individually brilliant creative people is just such a huge privilege, you know? It's, it's, it just feels like it's an all-star team. And it's a, it's a really exciting thing to be able to bring a story like this to a group of people and say, you know, if you're willing to jump in and it's going to be a little unpredictable and we don't know how much of your time we're going to need, it might turn out to be to dominate you for three months and then it's, we're going to disappear for three months. But being able to get that level of experience and quality out of the people that we're working with is really, it's so inspiring. It just makes you want to do your job better and it makes you feel like you're, you're constantly raising the bar on how good this thing can be. Yeah. There's also the instant matter, which is that there's a real family that got terribly damaged in this story, the McCormicks, and they really all these years have been like on the edge of their seats saying like, you know, what, what can you guys do to make this story more known, to not have people forget about Kathy? So I think people on our crew and, and all the, these department heads and people that we've been talking to, they all did feel that, you know, they all felt like we were doing something that was valid and important. And then finally, you know, in this part two, being able to tell a story about how decent people get 
roped into being complicit in terrible acts, you know, that's something that's that's big picture. And so being able to bring this group of people in on a story that can help illustrate how dangerous it is when people become complicit was was a big privilege. And I think people felt that who were working on it, that we were telling a story that was important at a few levels. I agree. And I think a lot of that is a testament to you and that you had that vision from the very beginning that if we were going to do a part two, that it really had to be about something. You kept us focused on that in a, in a great way. And I think it really shows. Thank you. I'm very happy to hear that and just happy to reconnect with all these guys because, you know, it's been a little while. Yeah, that was so fun. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. As always, this was awesome. This was so good. The official Jinx podcast was hosted by me, Zach Stewart Pontier. It's produced by ZSB Media and Hit the Ground Running Films with HBO. Both parts of the Jinx are available now on Max. This episode was produced by Ramoy Phillip. The rest of our team is Ethan Oberman, Laura Newcomb, and Naomi Bronner. The supervising producer is Liz Stiles. Mixing and engineering by Sam Baer. It was recorded by Sam Baer at Relic Room in New York City. Music by the Mondo Boys, Wes Dylan Thordson, and John Kusiak. Additional music courtesy of HBO. The executive producers are Andrew Jarecki and me. Special thanks to Esme Smith, David Jacobson, and Michael Gluckstadt, Ali Cohen, Aaron Kelly, and Savon Slater at HBO Podcasts. And the fabulous, now Emmy-nominated Jinx team, Sam Neve, Kyle Martin, Richard Hankin, Charlotte Kaufman, Susan Lazarus, Annabelle White, Pedro Vital, Jesse Herman, Michele Zabarfian, and Nako Narder. And thanks to Roe Dillon, George Vogel, Charlie Wessler, Nancy Jarecki, and Emily Wiedemann. And to say farewell, here's a funny moment from one of our calls. To put the mask on, I put it on by myself because I've had um, a childhood ailment of nosebleeds ever since, oh, I don't know, like elementary school. And it's from the dry air or the simple touching my nose sometimes, and mm. it would you know, be a spontaneous bleed. But there's a product, which is nothing but a nasal gel. And if I can lubricate my nose <laughs> in advance, it's uh, more likely than not, it's this is, not going to bleed. This is a section brought to you by Nasal Spray. Use <laughs> code JINX2 for 10% off. <laughs>